That's good. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be going over uh, a key topic that um, will be of help in uh, problem set three, about which many of you have written, and that is the topic of calibration. Uh, I'm going to try to cover it in one lecture to secure as much help as we can for um, you doing that, that third problem in a timely fashion. Uh, I, of course, will be having office hours uh, this week. I'll continue having office hours through the 16th, um, and I'm glad to make, uh, make further appointments uh, if people uh, need that. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through calibration as a, um, as a topic today. So just a reminder of where calibration fits in in the broader context of modeling. Um, we have a, uh, oops, excuse me, looks like, um, okay. Oh, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Um, that was, that was my bad. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, give me a second. Tell me if you can see it. Okay. Um, so uh, model calibration uh, is uh, a very important step simultaneously in, in building confidence about a model on the one hand and estimating model parameter values on the other. It uh, would typically follow quantitative model formulation, but proceed many components of uh, model testing, although often some elements of model testing are done before calibration. So, that, so the relative timing of calibration and, and model testing is, is more flexible than this diagram would indicate. Typically, it would come before policy evaluation. And model calibration involves um, reproduction of, of qualitative behavior of, of interest. Within system dynamics uh, modeling classically, um, when we're dealing with more aggregate models, we might be trying to match reference modes, uh, modes of, of change of uh, stocks or uh, auxiliary variables or flows over time. Um, and uh, sometimes we'll want to do that at a very quantitative level, um, trying to match their quantitative values. In other cases, we're trying to capture at a phenomenological level what's going on. Is it oscillating? Is it exhibiting unstable behavior? Is it converging quickly? Um, is it exhibiting sort of an overshoot and collapse type of situation? Um, often uh, model calibration involves some qualitative components as well as quantitative. In this lecture, we're going to be con concentrating on the, the quantitative forms of it. It turns out those can be broadened to involve qualitative comparisons as well if you have tools which can classify sort of qualitative behavior modes. And there are tools out there if anyone's interested I can refer you to. Um, tools based on hidden Markov models, um, uh, dynamic uh, uh, pattern matching with uh, time warping, etc. But we're going to be concentrating on matching uh, at a quantitative level uh, behavior of the model. And broadly we could, I, I, I should note that the calibration process is often one that goes on in an iteration with model formulation. Sometimes one encounters problems in calibration that suggest that the model structure may not be appropriate. And it's an opportunity sometimes uh, for going back and revisiting that model structure, changing it in a way that um, would elicit more plausible forms of behavior. Behavior, emergent behavior from the model that better matches our understanding of patterns in the world. Again, with system dynamics models, maybe reference modes over time of stocks and flows. With age of base models, these might be spatial patterns or pat patterns over networks, et cetera. So there's often this iteration with model formulation. And one of the, well, while uh, having difficulties in model calibration can be frustrating, it's also one of the tremendous opportunities that's available for learning about your model, for learning something important about what it takes to reproduce real world patterns. So often model calibration step is a step where we make get substantive insights on really what's needed to explain behavior in the external world. 
Occasionally, our model structure may be perfectly adequate to the task from the get-go, but off, as often as not, it involves adding stocks, enabling a new flow within the model, um, eliminating a stock, and, and seeing if we can match behavior um, with the requisite changes. So it's, it's not merely a, a process of tuning parameters. It's also a process of revisiting the model. It does, however, involve seeking to gain estimates for parameters that are less well known. And frequently, there's um, a variety of sources of data we may have already used. If we have a model that's seeking to quantitatively um, compare policies, we often will have really sweated details about, um, about estimates for model parameters. And we may have drawn them from the literature. We may have drawn them from surveillance data large-scale data sets such as run by um, uh, StatsCan within Canada or by particular researchers. We may use data from reports of outbreaks, say it's the number of cases of H1N1 over time in the Vancouver area. Um, we may have um, clinical data of our own, um, and we may have um, results of interventions that have been run that we try to match. Frequently, however, we don't have reliable information on a subset of the parameters. So we may have information about many of the parameters, but, but not about certain parameters. At the same time, we often will have a lot of data we haven't used in model parameterization. We haven't put directly into a parameter because that data doesn't directly speak to one particular parameter. Instead, we'll often have data on kind of the emergent behavior of a system. It doesn't relate to one particular parameter, but it's, it's an aspect of overall system behavior. And in calibration, we're going to seek to leverage that data. So, um, you know, sometimes this is data that's more aggregate. It doesn't have the breakdowns we're needing, but the model needs to reproduce it when we aggregate up the model results. So once again, it may not allow us to estimate particular parameters for a particular subgroup of the population, but it relates to, say, the behavior of the entire population. And whatever assumptions we do have about subgroups, they need to add up to yield the observed data. Now, it turns out that um, frequently we'll engage in a process of what's, what's often called backing out, where we take aggregate pieces of data and we use them collectively to figure out what more detailed assumptions might have to be to explain that data. And backing out is sort of a uh, poor cousin to calibration. Or to put it another way, it's a more analytically constrained analog to calibration. So often we're imposing some pretty strong assumptions here. Uh, and we combine data from different contexts and try to elicit parameter estimates from that. So I'll give um, one or two examples. So suppose we have, um, we have uh, some information, say, on the breakdown of the population by sex, so how many men, how many women there are, um, the overall prevalence of diabetes, so what fraction of people in the overall population have diabetes. And suppose we have the, the ratio of prevalence among women and men from some other report in the literature say, from another, another province. And we might want to assume that a similar um, uh, ratio occurs here. So if we make these assumptions, and these are, there are assumptions involved that this other province is representative of our own, we could back out, as it's called, the sex-specific prevalence from these aggregated data. So collectively, given these three assumptions, the breakdown of the population, the population-wide prevalence of diabetes for, say, Saskatchewan, and the prevalence rate ratio, in other words, the ratio of prevalences of diabetes in women compared to men for Alberta, we might try to estimate for Saskatchewan what the prevalence is for females on the one hand and for males separately. And to do that, it's a simple exercise in, in algebra. So we know there's, there's some uh, overall prevalence for the total population, times the size of the total population. And what we're seeking is this P sub M, prevalence among men, and P sub F, prevalence among women. We have C sub F, the count of women and count of men. 
Now, we're not going to be able to solve that from one equation. There's two unknowns and one equation here. So we need some additional information, and we might make the assumption, for example, that the ratio of these prevalences in Saskatchewan is the same as in Alberta. Um, that's an assumption. And often this type of backing out imposes some pretty strong assumptions like that to be able to reach its conclusion. So we might assume that the prevalence rate ratio, the ratio of these prevalences is the same as in Alberta, without assuming the particular prevalences are. And using that additional constraint, we can arrive at particular estimates of the prevalence among men and the prevalence among women. The disadvantages of this are that um, it often involves questionable assumptions. A very common one is equilibrium. So we might assume that stock is in equilibrium, so that its, its value is just equal to the value of the outflow, um, uh, uh, say the value of the inflow observed. We'll so assume the outflow is equal to the inflow, and so we'll take the inflow and we'll multiply that some times some dwell time, some average time in the stock to get the stock value. These are, these are strong assumptions, and we impose those on our situation. Um, in other cases, the model is too complex to do this. The, the pieces that we do know are scattered around the model, and we can't do simple algebra to figure out figure out what these value must be. There, there may be no closed form relationship between what we do know, C sub M, C sub F, and this RR sub F, and what we have to know over here. And in those cases, we'll do calibration. Um, incidentally, here's another, another case of it that you could look at from the slides. So the process of calibration in some sense involves triangulating from diverse data sources, but it's not analytic triangulation. We're using the model and specifically, we're adjusting values of less well-known model parameters to best mass observed data. And this data may be qualitative again or quantitative. It may be spatial patterns. It may be patterns over time. And typically here, we're trying to match against many time sources, time series at the same time. So we're taking one model and holding it to account to many particular pieces of data we have about the situation, say many time series. We're trying to get the model essentially to answer the question, what must these less well-known parameters be in order to explain all these different data sources? So in order to explain all these different data sources, you know, what must be the underlying parameters within this system dynamics model? Okay. Um, so here we are not going to be sure that the model that comes out of this is correct. Indeed, it may be that we've got the wrong model that we're dealing with. But at least we're going to have a model that if it can match all of these, it at least has some measure of face validity. It has some measure of plausibility. It has, um, it's in some sense accountable to the different data sources that we'll see. And occasionally we'll find problems with the data sources. We'll find that the data sources were inaccurate, they were redefined, they were inconsistent, and we'll learn about that, which is also valuable. That's happened a number of times in my experience. So um, here we're seeking an opportunity to learn about the data, learn about the model, learn about the parameter values. So we're trying to find, as it were, a plausible dynamic hypothesis that explains the data and maybe a reasonably good guess for what the underlying situation is. And importantly, it helps us leverage a large amount of diffuse information that doesn't speak to one parameter or just one or two parameters. Instead, it constrains our understanding of the model behavior as a whole or large portions of the model. Okay, So we may have a lot of data which can't be used directly in parameterization, but which we can use for calibration. Okay, So how are we going to do this? Well, the typical approach that's taken across many platforms is to use a global optimization algorithm of some sort. So we're going to try to adjust parameter values for less well-known parameters until the model as a whole best matches this observed data. And to do that, we're going to have to give it lots of information, including what we mean by a best match. But we're trying to adjust these parameters so that it matches an arbitrarily large set of data. 
And uh, the data itself, which may be time series, may be data points, forms constraints on the optimization. Or rather, it contributes to the objective function of the optimization. In some cases, it's, it's constraints on it. How far um, we can go may be dictated uh, by, by the parameter, parameter information rather than the data to be matched. The optimization algorithm will run the model thousands of more times to find the best match for all the data. So we have parameter ranges, say from zero to one for a prevalence that we may be adjusting. Those form the constraints. Um, so uh, this is uh, data associated with what we do know about possible parameter values. And uh, the data, this should really say, defines the objective function, um, forms the objective function of the calibration. Um, so of the calibration. Okay, so um, here we're going to be adjusting the parameters to best match things, and this optimization algorithm is going to help for that. So what information are we going to need to specify? Well, we're going to need to specify what's called an error function, which specifies how bad a given match is compared to what we are hoping to achieve as the ideal on match. So we need some way of, of describing to the calibration how far off we are, how, how bad the fit is. Um, this is how good, but it's really, uh, in many cases, what we're specifying, and to be consistent here, I'm going to say how bad the fit is. Some packages, you can specify how good. One is just the negative of the other, typically. Um, so we could specify an error function. Alternatively, we could specify a payoff function, which could just be minus the error function. So the closer it gets to zero, the, the, the better and better it would be. The minus the value would be getting, getting closer and closer to zero from the negative side. So that would be its maximum. So, um, so we need this error function specified. We need to specify what to match, what data to match, and what parameters to value and over what to vary and over what range to vary them, the so-called parameter space. And then we have to specify characteristics of the desired optimization algorithm, such as where to, where to start. So typically here, we're going to have a parameter space that looks like this. This is a 3D parameter space. And we're going to be adjusting parameters within this space. So at any one time, we may be in a certain place within the space, which has a specific value for mu, a specific value for tau, in a specific value for, for beta. And we're going to be wandering over the space as part of the global optimization algorithm, trying to find the point in this space that exhibits the best match to the data we're trying to match. So we're going to be at different points of the space systematically. We're going to be exploring. For each such point, we're going to run the model. A system dynamics model will typically be run one time. An agent-based model runs a number of times. And we're going to judge the goodness of fit at that point. And we're going to remember it. And we're going to go through the space, remember the best fit, and report that. OK. So how to judge goodness of fit the model? Well, or badness of fit. We need to find some way of quantifying this. So we're going to have to, for each historic piece of data, calculate the discrepancy of the model, and then in some sense total those up, um, sum up the discrepancies. Okay. Now, it turns out that, that this choice of a discrepancy function, how to describe how bad the match is, is not totally obvious. And I've listed here some properties of this that um, are frequently going to be desirable for you when you're running these sort of models. A very important feature is that it be dimensionless. We want to be able to have a model where maybe some of the data we're matching up relates to costs. Some of the data we're matching up relates to estimates of count of people. Some of the data we're, act, uh, we're adding up may relate to incidence rates, people per unit time. And yet we'd want to be able to add up discrepancies gained from each of these areas. We'd like to be able to add them together. And to do so, it needs that discrepancy metric 
can't have uh, dimension associated with it. it. Can't be measured in people because then we can't add it to a cost discrepancy. So typically, we'll make use of dimensionless discrepancy measures, um, measures that, uh, for example, express a fractional discrepancy, how far off it is in proportional terms. We'd like it to be weighted. So we'd like to be able to put more emphasis on data we think is better grounded. For analytic reasons, we'd often like to be able to differentiate it. So having an analytic is nice. Um, for reasons I don't have time to go into uh, in a big way, it should be concave. So if we have the choice between, if we're trying to match, let's say, cost data on the one hand and data on the count of people with diabetes on the other, we don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. So to speak, we don't want to have no match, you know, a, a perfect match for cost and be way off in terms of the count for accounts of people. Instead, we prefer two small discrepancies of size A to one of zero and one of size 2A. We'd like, we'd like to sort of spread those discrepancies among a, a smaller set of, uh, of factors rather than having them all concentrate on one factor. Again, don't want to rub Peter to pay Paul. Symmetric. Um, so we, we'd like it so that if we're off by a factor of two in either direction, you get a similar discrepancy. It should be non-negative. We shouldn't have some negative discrepancies that cancel out other discrepancies. And finally, it should be finite. We shouldn't get infinite discrepancies for, for finite um, inputs. So here's one discrepancy which matches this. Take the historic, if you have historical model values being guaranteed to be non-negative, say counts of people or counts of dollars spent, we might have the historic minus the model over the average of the two, square so that it's concave. This, this quantity in here, this uh, quotient, the H minus M over H plus M over two, we're just taking the difference between the two and dividing it by the average of the two. And that is dimensionless. And uh, what that allows us to do is to get a quantity out that's something like a fraction that we can add up, regardless of whether it's computed for costs, computed for persons, we can add them up. If we just had H minus M here and got rid of this denominator, if historic and model were counted in persons, and then we had another case where they're counted in dollars, we couldn't really add them together. How do you add a person to a dollar? So by keeping this dimensionless, we, we actually gain some benefits in terms of adding them up. So this is the model discrepancy for one particular set of data points, points of data. And then we'll typically add these up over many points of data. So we'll sum them up over various data points. Now, you'll notice that there's a weight in front of it, this W term. And um, there's a couple reasons for the, that we'll use weighting. One is, if we care more based on the purpose of the model about certain types of matches more than others, we may give them higher weight. Secondly, if we have estimates for reliability of data, such as we know that certain data like incidence data jumps around a lot because of small numbers, and, uh, and certain other data like prevalence data is more stable, we may factor that into this estimate as well. And finally, if there's no data that exists for a given point in time, say for a given year, there's no data on cost, then we give it a weight of zero, and there's no discrepancy added. Okay, so essentially this weight is zero, and we count there being no discrepancy if there's no historic data value to use. So one simplistic global optimization algorithm, which is traditionally used by Vensum, I think Vensum may be upgrading to a a more rigorous algorithm in this latest version, or certainly in a coming version from what I hear. Um, this is the very simplest one. This is what can be called a hill climbing algorithm. Um, if you're viewing this as a payoff function rather than a penalty function. So here we start at a random position in parameter space. So we start with random values being grabbed for parameter values within the ranges that are legal. And then we try to adjust those parameters, run the model, record the error function for each set point, and we keep on running it until we reach a best point. If you're judging in terms of 
an error function, it's a local minimum. If you're judging in terms of a payoff function, it's a local maximum. It's just a matter of whether you want to view it as a badness of fit or a goodness of fit. One is the minus of the other. And then maybe you add some randomness to knock out of this local minimum. So if I start at this point in space and maybe it goes down and, you know, lands, uh, gosh, I got to create a local minimum. It kind of lands here and it sort of sits in here for a while. This is kind of its local minimum. And then maybe you add some noise to it. There's sort of a, a, a Boltzmann algorithm that may, may add noise in. Maybe it, it goes up a little bit, gets down here, and then it, it's better than it was, but it starts wandering around, and eventually it goes, whoa, there's, there's a much better situation. It goes down to the floor, and it's going to have a hard time getting out of this floor, and eventually it may end up there. Now, there's much more sophisticated global optimization algorithms. Um, th there can be whole classes taught about global optimization. This is sort of the crudest that you can find, but it actually can do, in many cases, if it's not too rough a space, not too rugged a space, there's not too many local minima, it can actually do a decent job. And Vensim's global optimization uses an algorithm very much uh, like this. Any logic has a more sophisticated algorithm associated with it based on what's known as genetic programming. Actually, genetic algorithms, I should say. So it actually, um, it actually will try to find various best points and combine them in intelligent ways, sort of mutate them to find other best guesses for what good points might be, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you for the duration of this class to open SIR agent-based calibration in any logic, okay? Um, and we're going to go through, in some measure of detail, how we carry out these calibrations within any logic, how we define the payoff function, how we define what parameters to vary, and how we um, judge when to stop, etc. So SIR agent-based calibration, um, you may remember it's one of the how-to models within any logic, and I'm going to go open it up here as well. And it was one of the models we saw last, uh, last week. Okay, so... Um, we had talked about it for the uh, sensitivity analysis too. Okay, so if we open it up and we go to the calibration experiment, mm -hmm. um, you may remember that last week we had talked instead about this uh, parameter variation experiment. We're now on to calibration. So we're gonna open up this calibration experiment and I'll show it on the slide here for annotation. Um, this is similar, it shares characteristics with the sensitivity analysis in that, like sensitivity analysis, it's going to be running the model, many, the main class, many, many times. It's going to be running many runs of the model, and in fact, often many realizations of a model for a given set of parameters. So, so like we saw last time, the calibration experiment, like the parameterization, parameter variation experiment, is going to outlast the lifetime of the main class. It's going to call a main class into existence. It's going to let that main class's life play out before its very eyes. And then the main class is going to disappear. But before it disappears, it's going to collect some information from it. And uh, that will allow it to run many, many runs with this main class. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this um, calibration experiment. Let's go to properties in general, and you'll start to notice a couple of things. First of all, you notice that there's some optimization stop conditions specified. This speci specifies after how many different parameter value variations do you want to stop? How many so-called iterations, okay? So for each of those, you can be varying some parameters. After how many of those do you want to call it quits? Say enough is enough. In this case, it's 500. Which parameters are going to be varied? Well, I guess I should probably for continuity, I should say the other alternative is an automatic stop where it, sees, it, it stops it after it ceases to improve significantly. And uh, 
this can be convenient. On the other hand, it may prematurely terminate the optimization. If I'm not mistaken, we may come back and, and revisit this point about um, under what conditions it will stop. Okay, um, but we have these. We have the flexibility to do that. And then finally, there's these parameters that can vary here, um, that are specified down here as varying. And this specifies the range in which they vary, whether to do so in a uh, continuous fashion or fixed fashion. In other words, to do it as a set of steps, or whether to do it um, in uh, within some range, uh, as finely as, as required. Okay. So here we're varying contact rate and we're varying infection probability. Okay. Um, okay. Now, arguably the most critical thing shown in this slide, and certainly one of the most puzzling, is you'll notice that there's an objective function specified. And you'll notice that, moreover, that any logic provides you with the, the opportunity to specify whether you want to minimize this function or maximize it. Minimize it, viewing it as an error function or penalty function. In other words, if, if this function were measuring the badness of it, sort of the discrepancy, or we could seek to maximize it if we're viewed as, as the opposite. And again, often one is just the negative of the other. In this case, we're trying to minimize this discrepancy. And you'll notice here that it's using a built-in function. Um, so... Uh, it's using this function difference uh, DS infection current. Let me go to this uh, slide here. DS infection current uh, and DS infection historic. Now, we're going to go back and figure out where those things came from. From the names, you might guess that they are what? Data sets. Good. Um, those are two data sets whose references are being passed to a built-in method called difference, which computes the Codian difference uh, between them. So it views them as points in an n-dimensional space. And in fact, I think in this set, uh, they are one-dimensional each. So um, you're computing the... Um, uh, no, no, excuse me. It is, I think, uh, it can be n-dimensional. Um, so the square root of the average of the, excuse me, no, I, I'm standing, standing correct. These are, these are uh, single-valued functions, data sets each. But what it's doing here is they're vectors. They're vectors. So in other words, um, one is a historic data vector. For each of several points in time, it measures the historic values. The other is the empirical values. And it's summing up the square of the differences between them and taking the square root and returning that. So you can think of it as kind of Euclidean distance, okay? Um, so this is a built-in function in any logic. We're gonna see how we can define custom functions in, a, in just a bit. But here they're using a built-in function to specify the discrepancy between these two data sets, okay? And you can find this defined in, in the library. Um, alternatively, we could, um, we could make use of our own function you could give it a different name. Um, and uh, here, within this function, we might, for example, um, uh, total up the absolute values and the differences. That would that would have a disadvantage of not being analytic. It wouldn't be concave, um, which uh, is less nice. But the point is we can define our own function to judge discrepancy. Importantly, if we defined our own function, it could compute the difference with respect to many different data sets, data sets with respect to different data that you might collect. And in fact, in problem set three, problem three, I asked you to collect data on several different sorts of information from the model and compare it to historic data for those uh, types of information. So you might want to create your own custom function, otherwise you could uh, sum together uh, several functions. I believe either of those, uh, I, I'd have to go back and look at the problem, but I believe that the design would allow for either of that. In any case, um, in this case, we're going to be comparing two data sets, 
One of them is historic data, and one is data from the model. So how are we going to do this? Well, uh, first of all, for the historic data, we'll define that in what's known as a table function. Okay? And a table function provides a way, within any logic, of specifying a function over some domain, a range over some domain, some, some uh, set of values, in this case, time, it specifies values for each of those points of time. In this case, it's specified every two time units, some, some data point. In this case, we, we have these data points defined here, and there's some interpolation which can be done, and there's some handling of outer range values which can uh, indicate an error, and tra extrapolate, etc. cetera. Um, and the interpolation allows for a couple different uh, types of interpolation, which is good. Okay. So we're going to have some historic data, which are defined within this table function. And we're going to need to put this to compare it using difference. To compare it using difference, that data, that historic data, will have to live where, ladies and gentlemen? Where will this data have to live to compare it? Wherein lives this data at this point? In a data set, exactly. Um, so we have this historic data right now in a table function. We're defining it in table function. We're specifying it in a table function. We're going to have to get it into a data set to, to make it comparable using that, that difference function. So let's start to piece apart this code that's provided. So uh, if we go to the calibration experiment and we go to the advanced tab, there you will see arrayed before you um, the various code to execute at various stages of the, of the calibration experiment. And this code will be critical for your problem three and problem set three. So hopefully the comments here will give you a leg up on that. Okay. Um, so you'll notice that in this advanced tab, we have several different fields to fill in. Some of them are particularly common. Um, others provide extra flexibility. So for this initial experiment setup, we are going to be setting up data that is not going to vary within the whole experiment. It's not going to vary between runs of the model, between realizations of the model, nor for different runs of the model with different parameter values. It's going to remain the same across multiple runs of the model with different parameter values. And the one thing we do have to set up here is we want to establish the historic data. So at this point, the initial experiment setup, it's set up for the calibration experiment, which is going to run all these different runs of the underlying simulation with different parameter values. Here we're going to say DS infection historic dot fell from this table function. So that's going to populate, that's going to fill this data set with data from these, this historic value, that data here. Okay? It's going to be filled in to this data set. Okay? So that DS historic, you'll recall, DS infectious historic, that's what we're going to be comparing every time we have run something, we're going to compare the data from that run to this historic data. So as a result of that fill from, we filled up all the information we need for this DS infectious historic. The next thing is we're going to have to fill up this DS infection current. And let me ask you this, folks, based on what I've said, DS infection current, DS infectious current, what is that going to be? Give me a rough sense. What is that? We're calling difference between the historic data and this thing, DS infectious current. What is that thing? What is DS infectious current? Oh, okay. So it's drawn from where? That information has come from the simulation from running the model and it's yes it's the the, the values conceptually of the stock so though in this case it's an agent based model so the stock is a conceptual stock um it's it's the sum of all people who are in that state 
this is an important point Riley is is making there, um, or is pointing to there. Um, it's actually very useful, um, in my view, to think about stocks and flows, even though they may be realized in an agent-based fashion. You can still fruitfully ask questions about flows, like how many people are getting infected now, how many people are recovering within the last you know, amount of time. That's still a useful way of, of, our, of sort of thinking about the dynamics of what's going on. So I would say, yes, at a conceptual level, this is a stock value, although in this case, it happens to be realized in many particular individuals. So DS infectious current is going to somehow have to come from the simulation model. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be read out of the simulation model. Yes. Comparing DS infectious current to DS infectious historically, why don't we just directly use an infectious historic? What's the point of having a separate data set? Uh, in other words, why why do we have this data set here instead of uh, a table function? Yeah. I don't believe. Um, oh, you're right. So there is uh, probably at the time this is written, there is no option of doing that. So you're saying, why not just put in the table function directly? Uh, looks like any logic, so any logic, the previous version before this did not allow that. Oh. Now it does. So my guess is um, there's some refactoring to be done. Okay, so it's just a historic reason? I think it's a historic reason. Okay. Maybe that's why it's, well, I can speculate, maybe that's why it's DS infectious historic. Um, but uh, no, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's just, um, Accent. You could have used the table function directly. I would hazard a guess that that should work just fine. I haven't verified that. If you want to test it, I would encourage that. Um, I think that could simplify things. You know, more generally, there may be cases where that historic data does not come from a table function. It comes from a database, and you want to read it into some intermediate vessel to then use to compare, in which case, um, you know, data set might be as good as any other mechanism, right? So you might read it in from a file or from a database or might might get it from some live data feed or whatever, in which case you want to, you want to have a place to put it. But it's a great question in this case. Okay, um, so Dylan pointed a, a route to simplification. Um, but we're going to have to see where that DS infectious current comes from. Okay, so let's, we've talked about where you get DS infectious historic. Let's start to explore um, DS infectious uh, uh, DS infectious um, uh, infectious current. Okay, uh, we're going to see where they come from. Then I'm going to go back and make a point. I actually gave this lecture in a slightly different order on this on this score last time. Um, so if you want to see a different formulation, you can watch it on YouTube. But um, if we want to consider DS infectious uh, current where that data set is coming from, the one we compared to historic, where that's going to come from is, first of all, it's it's going to, um, well, it's going to be calculated in this DS infectious current dot fill from root dot DS infectious, okay? Um, so this is where we're essentially salvaging the information from main that we're going to need in order to see if it's the best one thus far. Okay, um, so uh, to be clear here, we have some data sets that are within the experiment, the calibration experiment here. Those data sets are going to persist beyond the main class. So here, we're going to read out data from the main class, root.ds infectious, and we're going to hide it, we're going to salvage it and put it into our DS infectious current which lives within this experiment and therefore is going to be available after that iteration is run, okay? Um, so before that disappears, we're gonna have to squirrel the data out. Where did we see something like that before, within our last lecture? Where did we see something like that, salvaging data? Does anyone remember? It's in our last lecture. We did something very comparable to this last time. Is that the 
That's exactly it. So in a parameter variation experiment, we needed to draw a histogram, a 2D histogram, no less, of the values showing how many trajectories fell for a given small interval of time, they fell into a given small interval of possible values of the number of people infectious. And in order to graph that out, we have to create a 2D histogram data set. And to populate that, we actually salvage data out of our main class, and we put it into a DS infectious current or something along those lines, and we put it into the, uh, the, the 2D uh, data set. In any case, we got it into the 2D data set from this value which had been in main class. In both cases, what we're trying to observe here is that the main class, its job in life is done and it's gonna disappear. So we gotta get our data out of there if we wanna, if we wanna have access to it. So after the simulation run, when it completes, we rescue the data and then we're going to go through and um, we're going to, to compare it. Um, and to do this, I'm going to need to talk a little bit about stochastics. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, this lecture applies to the three types of modeling used in any logic. Agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, discrete event modeling. Typically in system dynamics models, unless you deliberately add stochastics, they're going to be deterministic. And one run for a given set of parameter values one one will be sufficient to get you the result. So in short, if we go back here and uh, go look at our parameter space that we're exploring in calibration, for a given point within this parameter space, it's going to have one value beta, you know, a specific value of beta, tau, and, and uh, mu associated with it. You're going to run the model. You could run it 10 times. Every time, if it's a deterministic system dynamics model, it's going to secure the same value. With an agent-based model, is it going to get the same value exactly for the number of people infected over time if you run it 10 different times? No. No, we saw that with stochastics. Even without varying these parameters, it's going to get different values. Maybe just slightly different, but different. Sometimes they may be very significantly different. There may be no outbreak in one and a big outbreak in another. We actually saw cases of models with no outbreaks. You run them 10 times, one time there's no outbreak. So, so we're going to have stochastics in general for our models. Not always, but in general. For discrete event and for agent base, that's going to be run of the mill, par for the course. So ABMs typically exhibit stochastics, um, and when calibrating, we don't want to attribute a good match at a particular point in space just to the luck of the draw, simply due to chance. And we don't want to overinterpret a bad match as indicating that the parameter values are way off from their from their proper values and their best values, best fit values, if the match is poor. So we don't want to just be at, at the uh, you know, be vulnerable to the whim of one particular simulation. Um, uh, you know, be uh, be dependent on the result of one simulation. To assess it for a given set of parameters, we typically need to repeatedly run the model a number of times, and then we could take the mean for those realizations, for example. Now we may not always want to take the mean. No, you could take the max or something like that, but uh, any logic has it particularly easy to take the mean across a bunch of realizations. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I distinguished for you, I delineated, um, I believe two lectures ago, maybe it was just one, the difference between an experiment, a simulation, and a replication. And I noted that throughout most, most, most of the class, these three are basically the same. We had one experiment which we would run. It would run the model a single time, so for a single realization, and with a given set of parameter values, a single simulation, and it would run it once. Then we start to talk about, last time, with sensitivity analysis, 
an experiment which would run the simula multiple simulations for different parameter values. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the chickens are coming home to roost, and we're going to have replications as well. We're going to explore all three levels of this. We're going to have multiple realizations of the model running for a given simulation. In other words, we're going to run the model for a given assignment of parameter values. Beta equals 2. Mu equals 3.14159262727, etc. And, you know, uh, tau equals uh, 2.718. We're going, to, we're going to run the model many times for that. Not just once, but many times so that we can gain a measure of confidence that if it's a good fit, it's not just the luck of the draw with a single, a single realization. Okay? Um, so we're going to have to, to run this. Now, we're going to see how this uh, plays out. But once we do that, we're going to then try to match, okay, if, if this uh, iteration is the best one, if the current iteration is the best iteration, then we're going to fill up our best data set, our data set recording the best value, the best fit values from that. So this after iteration code, um, once it's run all its realizations, we're going to say, hey, if my, my mean match was better than the match the best match that's gone before, then remember me in this DS infectious best. Okay, um, and uh, if we run this, uh, run this. Maybe it's about time we run this. I often like to run these things before, but if we were to go run this here, um, what we would see is an attempt to attempt to match up this historic data shown in yellow with uh, different, um, uh, different fits of the model. So you can see already it's actually arrived at a pretty good one. Let me, let me stop that and um, retrace conceptually what's going on. So we're going to run, oops, it's remembered the best, so I'm going to clear this out and run it, run it away. Okay, so let's run this again. So let's, let's take a look. Okay, so it's Trying to find the best, it's doing various fits here for different values. This is the best one it's found yet. And then it's going to settle on a new best here. And you'll notice that it's running different iterations, and then it's running multiple replications within that iteration, in other words, multiple realizations. And the best one it found, according to its mean, the best fit was number four. Now, here we have different parameter values associated with each iteration. So each iteration is getting a new set of parameter values, building on what's been observed thus far. And for that new set, it's going to run multiple replications, multiple realizations of it, so that we, again, gain confidence. What we're seeing is, is not just an aspect of, of, of um, model noise, of stochastics. And if it finds a better one, it will, based on the mean um, fit for that iteration, it will adopt it. You'll notice that over time, it's getting better and better in terms of its, its calibration match. And indeed, it's matching up better and better uh, here visually. So there's some data points here coming out, and each time it gains a new um, iteration, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be uh, trying to pull down this curve to, to adopt the best one. You'll notice it's running on my dual cores here. Okay, so um, we're running this um, here, and if we look back, uh, this is the best uh, payoff objective uh, yet, excuse me, in, in red yet reached, and these are the values of the parameters at that best one. Um, Let's, let's go through some further aspects of it. We'll come back to the realization components. So you'll notice under the constraint side, you're allowed to specify two sets of things. Okay? One is constraints and simulation parameters. These will test if the parameter values are legal. Okay? Um, so is there some particular... Well, okay, if there's clear bounds on the parameters, 
we could have specified those earlier. We could have specified those back here. If they simply vary within some range, that's fine. However, we might want to have a constraint like one parameter is, is uh, greater than another, or two parameters don't sum to more than one. Now, there's multiple ways, as Jin knows, of doing this, um, to impose a constraint that one parameter is greater than another. But you can you could impose constraints that cut across multiple parameters here, um, prevent the sum of two parameters from being bigger than a third parameter, um, et cetera. So that's uh, on the constraint side. You can also specify so-called requirements. I want to distinguish these, ladies and gentlemen. The first of these are actually tested before a simulation runs. You're asking, hey, are these legal parameter values? The second of these is tested after a simulation runs, and it asks, okay, is the results of the simulation on the face of it legitimate? Or is there something very unrealistic? Like maybe, um, well, if it were a system dynamics model, maybe a stock value went negative for a count of people. Um, or maybe it's, um, you know, we get something that's way outside the range of uh, what our, our interests. So maybe we're trying to simulate epidemics, and if an epidemic doesn't occur, we just exclude it from our study. You can do this in the requirements uh, area and essentially throw out. So. so we have constraints on optimization on parameter values and combinations of parameter values. And then we have requirements which check the legitimacy after a simulation is run. I'd like to discuss now replications or realizations. Okay, so if we want this model to run, multiple realizations for a given iteration, in other words, for a given set of parameter values, a given vector of parameter values, given a specific assignment of values to parameters, if we want to run it many times, we can do so by clicking this checkbox, use replications. Now, we can either use a fixed number just say we're going to run it 10 times per, per realization, or excuse me, per iteration. Or we can request a varying number of replications. And in this case, we'll try to stop running new replications after you've met some, uh, secured some degree of statistical confidence, okay? Um, so this first one is fairly straightforward. So you'll always run each iteration 20 times over so that you know you, the stochastics aren't so pronounced in terms of your um, judging its goodness of fit. That will make the space less noisy. It will, it will mean that you'll be less likely to write off a set of parameter values when they're actually pretty good. It was just bad luck when you, when you ran them in terms of the goodness of fit. Okay, so with a fixed number of applications, that should be fairly clear. With a varying number of replications, basically we're going to indicate it's a stop when a certain confidence interval around the mean lies within a certain error percentage, a certain percentage around the mean for the iteration as of the most recent replication. So we're going to be running this thing many times for, for each successive realization. And we're going to be getting some running mean, right? And at some point, that mean is going to, and each time we run it, we're going to be getting a more and more tight confidence interval around that mean. And at some point, it's going to be tight enough that it lies within a certain percent of the mean value yet received, in which case we will stop. We'll stop our, our runs, okay? Um, so here we might have, after five replications, quite wide confidence intervals. So these might be, say, 80% confidence intervals. And we can actually specify what confidence intervals are we interested in, 50%, 80%, 10%. Let's suppose we said 80%. Initially, those confidence intervals may be quite wide. Because we've only run five replications, we've seen we've seen big variations in place, and 
we have some running mean, some sample mean from the five. And that's our running mean here, this, this um, blue bar in the middle. And we may have a certain error percent around it. So maybe this is 20% um, error as specified down here. This is error percent 0.5, for example. Um, so um, maybe, maybe we specify 20% error, in which case we have 20% bars around this. And still here, the confidence intervals are well outside this 20%. So we keep on running. We run another five simulations. We have another running mean here, which maybe is a little bit different from before. But our confidence intervals are tighter. Now our 80% confidence intervals are tighter. As a result of these new simulations we've run, we have a better and better sense of sort of the rely. Well, we have well, a more and more accurate sense of where the mean lies. So these confidence intervals are coming down, but they're still outside of these error bars. Note the error bars haven't, haven't moved. They're just always relative to this running mean that we've got. Now, after 40 replications, and I won't try to snap to this point, after 40 replications, the error bars may have come down far enough that they lie within these this sort of 20% uh, bounds around the mean. In that case, we're going to terminate. Okay, we're going to stop. Around. We need more, no more iterations. We've brought down these confidence limits to a comfortable level around the mean, and we could set that comfortable level to be within one percent of the mean, or what have you, and it will keep on running. Okay, so here we're throttling the replications based on the um, uh, based on the, the confidence intervals around the mean. Um, so this actually says empirical fractals. I think that's actually uh, confidence uh, intervals um, uh, around this around this mean point. Okay. Um, okay. Um, an important point for stochastic models is in the general tab, be sure that it's under random seed. This is something that occasionally students here come to me uh, wondering about. When you have these experiments, if you're going to be running them many times, make sure random seed is selected so that if you're running it several times, you're going to actually get different realizations out, not the same realization with, with the same seed. Okay. Now, that was a bit of a digression, but I want to talk about replications. So we were talking about running these replications. These replications that we're running either for this fixed count on the one hand, or this kind of variable thing where it keeps on running them until the mean is there. Let's let's talk about um, about these realizations. So, what's frankly a bit frustrating here is that any logic has some inconsistent terminology, at least in the version we're using. They may have fixed it in the latest version that's come out, um, uh, or that will come out next week or the week beyond, uh, version seven. So here, this after simulation run. It's actually talking about, well, let me ask you this, folks. Put your noggins together. Um, so describe to me again. I, I mentioned it earlier, but I'd like you to repeat to me what the function of this line is here. What, what is this line doing um, where my cursor lies here? What is, what is this, this first line doing here? This DS infectious current dot fill from root dot DS infectious. We pass it. By the way, for those not from computer science background, when I say I pass it information, I mean I give it as a parameter here. So I give it as an argument to this function. Um, so I'm passing it root dot DS infectious. I'm passing it a reference to the data set DS infectious, and I'm saying, hey. Fill DS infectious current from that. What's the purpose of that again? Tell me. Mm -hmm. What's what's the goal of that? What are why are we doing that? Why are we rescuing that data? What is root? 
What is this root? What is root? Oh, come on, folks. I've told you what root is several times. Um, what is root? What is root? <laughs> What is root here? It's a reference to me. It's a reference to me. That is it. Right. <clears throat> main dot infectious DS though? Um sorry? You can't. You can't. No, and and the reason is that main is the name of the class. It's not okay, this is a subtle point. That's a very good question. So the question was couldn't we just write main.infectiousDS? Main is the name uh, of a class, okay? Now, it turns out that for the class main, there's only one instance of it. There's only one object of, of main. It's so-called a singleton. There's only one of them around. There's only one stage at any given time. But that, that's, that, that name is root, okay, um, for reasons that... Um, remain a bit shrouded. Um, but actually, I think it's that it's the root active object within the hierarchy. It's, somehow it's notion. But in any case, that's the main object. That's how we speak to main. So we're, we're getting the S infectious from main there because main is transient. Main is going to disappear. It's going to disappear after this. But the point here is that we are rescuing this data after each and every run of this model. And each and every run there, I'm talking about each and every realization. I'm talking about on a per replication basis as well. Why? Well, it's for every realization that we get a different DS infectious. We may run 20 realizations, 50, 100, 100,000 for a given iteration. That is for a given specific assumption about parameter values. We may run the model many times many times over. But for each of those, we're going to get out a different DS infectious. Are we not? Different. Because it's going to be affected by stochastics. So every time we do this, when we see that, that it's rescuing from there, okay, you, you should be thinking, okay, that's, it must be doing that for on a per realization basis, because that's where, that's where it's produced on, on a given realization. Um, okay, we're, we're squirreling that away. And what it's going to actually do is then use that to figure out the the mean uh, the mean value associated with them. Okay, so I put in here a trace ln command to report for this particular realization the difference is, and I called difference here. Okay, so I called um, called this difference method. Uh, so that we could um, we could see what the difference is, and if, if you were to do that, what what you would see is that um, if we ran this, what we would see is that it it actually reports the best payoff at some point, and that payoff is different from any one realization. If you go through and you look at the payoffs reported from this line that we inserted, we looked at the payoffs for each realization, and you took the mean of them, you get the value specified here, the value for the objective. So where it says best here, it's judging which iteration is best, that is which assignment of, of values to parameters yields the best result as judged by its mean value of of that match for each of the parameter value, or sorry, each of the realizations in turn. Okay, um, so so this uh, difference method is actually called for each of these, and it's going to take the mean of those and judge whether this is the best simulation or not. So this judge here, if get iteration equals best iteration, it's 
taking into account the different realizations that have been used. And if it's the best, it's going to copy it to DS Infectious Best, and that will be used uh, to plot out sort of the, the best match thus far, the, the red match, I believe it is here. Um, okay, so. Yeah. So it runs a set of simulations with the same parameters a few times. Yeah. DS matches current. It takes the mean of that. No, no, yeah. no, no. What it's doing is it's taking the. So for each of those. Okay. So it's. So big picture, it's exploring this space here. Um, uh, in this. Whoa. In this calibration, it's exploring the space, right? And we call, when it gets to each new point in the space, we say it's beginning an iteration, okay? So at an iteration, it's at a given point in the space, okay? We'll, we'll call its presence at a point in the space an iteration. And for each iteration, it's going to run multiple replications, or it can, and in this case, it is, okay? Um, so... So uh, what any logic calls replications, um, I call realizations, it's this replications thing here. So it's using five replications, okay? Um, so if I made this 500, right, um, then for each point within this, ooh, sorry, within this space, it'll be running this model 500 times. And that would look like something like this. You'll notice that this is now running many, many times. Um, ooh, okay, so that's uh, okay. That's interesting. Um, let me just see if I had it throttled. Uh, throttled to do that. Okay, two. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's keeping on running on two. Okay. I was thinking this was was changing, but it's not. Thirty-three, thirty-four. So it's running many, many realizations here. Um, I see there's got it. Okay. Ooh, that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, this adds texture to it. I didn't explain this, but I'm gonna have to. Do you see how this keeps on flipping around? Does anyone have a conjecture why that's flipping around? Is it doing more than one iteration at the same time? Yes, that's exactly it. So it's running on different processes, different cores. It's actually running two different iterations. One of them is iteration two, and it's up to 84, 85, 80, 80. Number replication one, I don't know what it's up to. It's, uh, sorry, iteration one, it's up to um, something something smaller, I think. Um, but it looks like that's uh, through, oh, iteration three. Okay, in any case, it's running multiple things at the same time. But let's imagine I just have one core to simplify things. So for one core, What's it doing? It's kind of moving around the space. At a given point in the space, it's going to run an, uh, a realization, excuse me, iteration, which is going to consist of a set of realizations. So here it's running, you know, uh, many. It's going to actually run up to 500, right? Now, for each of those, it's going to be reporting, uh, recording away. After each realization, by the way, I'm trying to stop that so we can, um, so I can illustrate another thing here. For each point there, it's going to be, so for each realization that it runs, each time it's running the model with a different random number seed, what any logic calls a replication, what I'm calling a realization, it is going to take the data stored away and it's going to save it in this DS infectious current, okay? And based on that, it is going to, so, so let me show what those look like. Um, when, we, when we do this, we can have it print out for each of those what the difference is, right? Because for each of those points in, uh, for each of those realizations, this data that it salvaged is going to exhibit some discrepancy from the real data, right? For each of those, each of those data sets that it's taken out of here, 
there's going to be some discrepancy from the real data, right? Um, and that discrepancy is going to be judged according to, I've got to make sure my slides are consistent with this model here, according to, to this, this component right here, okay? Um, this difference, okay? So each time it's going to run this difference, right? And it is, therefore, for each of these elements that's recorded here, that's reported, for each realization, it's going to be running that difference, and we could report what that difference is. And then, once all those differences for all the realizations associated with a given iteration are complete, it's going to take the mean of them. It's going to find sort of, on average, how well did it did for this set of parameter values. And as we said earlier, the more that it does, the tighter sort of that estimate of the mean is, the better and better that estimate of the mean is. So if you do lots and lots of replications, in other words, lots of realizations, it's going to have a better and better estimate of, you know, sort of the average performance of that point within this parameter space, um, within this, this space here. It's going to have a more and more reliable or robust sense of how good that point is, right? And then it's going to choose as its best the point in that space which is um, is sort of uh, has has the best mean value and that's this this thing here get current iteration equals get best iteration then we're going to fill up the um, information on what's the best uh, from this um, from this current uh, current data set that's actually just the most recent one that was run does that make sense? Okay, so it's using this mean to judge sort of the goodness of the match, and it's moreover going to be uh, reporting the um, the, the uh, best match within these parameter values. So. This is actually an, an interesting point to look at. So part of what may be confusing you, Dylan, is if you open up this tab here and we go to, for example, um, the value associated with this thing here. Um, so this question mark, I'm trying to, um, these, these values are actually filled in, text 17, if you go look, I think it's in their dynamic properties. There we go. Okay, this is where the um, this is where some some of the hidden components um, are revealed. So so here we're we're getting to put into this label of the best parameter value, which is shown shown here. We're actually asking. The optimizer, hey, get me the best parameter value you've yet seen for contact rate. And this OQ is for OptQuest uh, value. So OptQuest is the name of the optimization package that's used to actually do this work. And so you're saying, okay, get for me the, the best value you yet seen for contact. Get me the contract rate associated with the... Um, with the best run thus far, and that's what, what puts that in there, okay? And similarly, um, there's uh, there's a similar thing for, for this value, infection probability. Um, for iteration up here, what you'll see is, uh, okay, so this, uh, yes, text 12, iteration. Um, uh, here it only enables it in, in certain cases. I guess that's that's filled in, um, maybe pulled in separately. I was thinking that that value might be specified here as well. Ah, here we go. Um, so for for the objective function, it's asking, okay, get the best objective value. So in short, what we have is a situation where there's um, there's some text that's filled in. 
in these labels using information from the AuthQuest analyzer, uh, optimizer. And in the problem set, if I'm not mistaken, I'm asking you to get that information as as part of that problem set using using that same sort of um, same sort of code. Okay. So does that quite answer your question? Okay. Okay. So just a few considerations before we fill, uh, finish up here. Um, if we consider optimization of this sort of calibration more broadly, um, there's a couple of things to fill in mind. Uh, first of all, calibration is not the only way to get an understanding of um, what values to use for parameter values. Uh, if I had more time in this class, I'd talk about other techniques we use, such as Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques to estimate posterior distributions over the parameters where we don't get just one parameter value. Instead, we get a distribution over possible parameter values. It's very powerful. Um, some other considerations is if we are calibrating, adding constraints in the form of data helps increase the, uh, the ability to identify particular parameter values that are, that are likely, the selection of a realistic best fit. Um, they help, help constrain sort of what our uncertainty is. Um, however, adding parameters to tune, the more parameters we have to tune, it leads to a larger space to, to explore. Adding too many parameters to tune can lead to a situation where there's many good matches, where there's many possible interpretations. Probably our next lecture, I'm going to be talking some about how we can use dimensional analysis to reduce the number of parameters to tune which is a very, um, uh, a very applicable thing for both sensitivity analysis and calibration. All these fits are within the constraints of the model. I've asked you in problem three of this, uh, problem set three, to, to consider the, um, uh, the effects of changing a bit of model structure and, and how that would affect things. And it's important to recognize that while the parameter estimates you get out of calibration um, may indicate plausible values, they do so with the assumption that you've got the right model structure. If your model structure is off and you're not calibra calibrating with respect to that, then, then you, know, you may get a situation where you have very precise parameter estimates, but the model as a whole is not going to be very accurate because the, the model is not, is not appropriate. Um, and there's a way of dealing with calibration problems. I don't think any of you are going to encounter this within this class, but it's possible in some of the projects that, that may come out. Um, and there's a whole art to learning how to get beyond calibration problems. Jin here has gone through quite a bit of this, uh, of, of, of trying, to, trying to figure out what's blocking it, trying to figure out um, how to address those problems, whether it's a problem with the model, um, a bug with the model, a um, problem with the data, or whether it's just you're, you're trying to get it to do too much, you need to add constraints between parameters or what have you. So um, there's, there's a, a bunch of techniques for trying to strengthen or trying to overcome hurdles within calibration. One of the best things you can do is, if you think you can do better, try to set the parameters such that you think will do better and see what goes wrong. See, see what's going on. Why is it that it doesn't want to do that? Often it may lead to an error in something else that you hadn't considered or a, a large discrepancy in something else. Um, if you're dealing with multiple objectives like you will in problem three, um, you know, if you have problems with these sort of things, um, with, with getting it to match, you could set a high weight on one value on, on one of the matches and see, see how it does. Um, it may reveal to you some of the problems that it's having. Um, other things you can do with calibration problems, sometimes you can increase the parameter range. You have to be very careful at increasing the number of parameters, but in some cases that may be possible. You can examine the impact of changed model structure run for a larger number of optimization runs. Maybe you just aren't running it enough to find a really good match, particularly with an agent-based model where it's a slower process because they need to run it many times, many realizations, and because each run is slower. 
And finally, you might be able to find other sources of estimates for the uncertain parameters. Um, you're going to want to ask, are the calibrated values unique? If so, that's good. If they're not, do they give the same underlying interpretation? Do they yield to different results for policy implications? Um, do they lead to parameters that trade off in some sort of uh, structured way? Um, and um, you know, if you do have this uh, ambiguity, you may really want to put a priority on collecting data that can um, that can address it, um, simplifying the model, imposing extra constraints, or find other estimates um, if possible. Um, right. Um, you may also want to look for um, uh, boundary constants. If 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 the bound if the model gives the best um, the best estimate for a parameter being right on the edge of what the applicable values are, that may be a worry because it may get even better on the other side. And you've got to ask, is that edge really something you're confident about? Why is it it looks so much better? Um, are, there, uh, are there certain constraints that are imposing it in that direction? Um, is the model structure possibly off? Um, well, uh, I'm going to have to finish up here, but uh, sometimes you have interdependencies between parameter values. You can capture some of them with constraints within any logic more flexibly than in Bensim. But in Bensim and any logic, you may want to consider expressing one parameter as a function of another, such as A is alpha times B, where alpha is always greater than one or less than one. And that, that can prevent A from being you know, less than one when you really think it's always great, uh, less than B when you really think it's always greater than B. You just constrain the values of the coefficient between them. So you, you said instead of calibrating A and B, you calibrate um, A and the ratio of B to A where you constrain that to B within a certain, uh, within certain bounds. Um, okay. Um, I should just say for those of you familiar with regression models, um, Calibration may seem similar to regression in the sense that we're trying to find parameter values along the best match of model and data. And there's a certain similarity there. A big difference is that in regression models, typically we know the functional form. So we specify a logit model or we specify a linear, a linear regression or a multi-level model, and we specify that explicitly. And that functional form is known. Even if it's a function of time, um, we, uh, we have a, a way of expressing it as a explicit function in so-called closed form, you know, e to the alpha t or what have you. In a simulation model, the behavior is implicit. It's specified implicitly by the model. When you go and you look at one of these models, it doesn't tell you what the behavior is over time. That is implicit based on the interactions between the components in that model. And in general, you're not going to be able to use any sort of analysis known, known today to go from a model description to an understanding of what behavior it can be produced other than by running that model for, for sufficiently rich nonlinear models that's going to be true. You're going to have to run the model to get its dynamic implications. And that's quite different from regression models, quite different from regression models, where typically you know the, the form, even if it's form over time, like e to the alpha t plus some noise term or what have you, you, you know what that form is. Here, you don't know what the form is. You're just specifying you know, transition probabilities and, and message, message sending and so on. And how that model behaves over time, the number of infectious people over time, for example, is an emergent property you're not going to be able to predict from that model structure until you run it. Okay, so uh, I give my lecture on calibration. I hope that will give you a bit of a leg up on um, on problem set three, which um, is going to involve some some challenges. Um, I guess I will say one other thing for for problem set three, since a couple people have encountered it, I'm just going to give a pointer. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, within um, any logic, any logic provides built-in functions that accomplish a, a lot of desired properties, okay, and a lot of desired features. Um, 
So for ex and we use these from very early on. So for example, if we have an agent named person, and that, that's of, of type person, we create our own agent classes. We may say this, if this refers to, to an agent, get, get uh, connected agent of zero, right? Um, and if we have a person and they're connected with other persons, we expect that to return a, a what? A person. But in fact, get connected agent, this, this method is actually defined not by us. We didn't have to write this, thank goodness, within our person class. It's actually defined by the agent class. Okay. It's actually defined by agent. So as far as it's concerned, it returns an agent. Now that agent could be a deer. It could be a person, it could be a truck, just judging by the projects in this class. It could be a, um, you know, it could be a doctor, it could be what, whatever agent classes could be, it, it could be. So it just calls it an agent. Similarly, if we have um, this dot uh, get nearest neighbor, it returns an agent of some sort. Now, within our model, we may know persons are the only type of agents in our model. It's the only agent class within our particular model. When the people who wrote Get Connected Agent created that in St. Petersburg five years ago, they didn't know what the agent classes would be named in their model, and so it just returns a generic agent. To turn that into a person, what do I have to do? Cast it. You cast it. It is a person. In this case, you know the only agents in your model are, are persons. If you had networks linking up deer and people in some odd relationships, um, or deer and dog, or people and dogs, or whatever, um, you know, within the model representing owners and pets or something like that, then you'd have to think: okay, is this a relationship between people, or is this a relationship between a person and an animal? And you have to think. In this case, you just cast it. So, within uh, within um, Java. You can cast, so-called cast it to a person. It, it's another word for it is type coercion. You coerce it to be a person. And that reflects the fact that a person is an agent. They're a subtype of agent, as it formally is called. And for those interested in that notion, I have a whole lecture on it in my um, agent-based modeling uh, lectures online you can find. But fundamentally, a person is an agent, a deer is an agent, a you know, a truck can be an agent. Any agent class you can create in any logic can be an agent. If this thing returns an agent, it's not going to magically know it's a person, so you sometimes have to cast it to person explicitly. And once you do that, you can treat it as a person. Now, if you want to create a variable that creates a reference to this, you could have person be, you know, person. So here we have a variable, which is sort of a temporary place that we can hold a reference to a person. And, and then this thing on the right hand side is, is casting. If we just had that, it would complain. It would say, it would say you're trying to assign a person, uh, you know, a, an agent to a person, um, something like that. And we do have to explicitly cast that, okay? We explicitly type coerce it because we know better than Java does here, that this is a, in fact, a person. Are there any questions about this, this side of it, this type coercion, and the need for that? Occasionally, this will come up, and it comes up because any logic provides so much in the way of automatically behind the scenes mechanisms, it just doesn't automatically know about what the classes are in your model. So you have to, you have to cast it to your particular class person. Any question about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this issue of declaring a variable is also talked about, although in another tutorial online, I'd be glad to pass anyone. But here we're just creating a, a temporary name for that, and then in the subsequent code we can say, you know, p dot dot. Or we could say, you know, delete uh, population of p or whatever, or we could say p dot, um, you know, send um, i or whatever. Um, so we could use P as just a reference to, to a person. Um, it's a reference to the 
and zero in this case, right? Uh, it's, it's a reference to my first agent connected to me, which happens to be at position oh, zero, right. judging by the conventions of computer science. Um, semicolons terminate statements, and uh, so that's a good thing to know about. They don't have to terminate expressions, um, and uh, in this case, it's a it's a statement, so uh, you'll want that uh, want that in there. Um, so those are are sort of some some basic pointers on how you can use these things. But uh, particularly those not from computer science science background, that may give you a little bit of a head up on that. Okay, any questions further? Okay. Um, so again, uh, office hours on Thursday, and I'm glad to to meet with people about projects or about problem set. Um, I do have uh, flexibility in the uh, turn of the problem set. Um,